welcome everybody this morning. We're uh, happy to have you here. Uh, we're, we're, this is the first of two videos that are going, going to be on the topic of timbre and the sound spectrum. And I don't necessarily expect that you recognize any of those words, but you will by the time we're done with these two sessions. So um, let's, let's just start with a little bit. If I, if I ask you to define what music is, how, how would you define it? Um, a series of notes or sounds that make something enjoyable. Oh. Yeah. Okay, a series of notes put together. Well, that's I, I like that definition. Anybody have another uh, angle on what on what music is? How you would define music? What makes the difference between music and noise? Is that noise music? Is not music. Music, noise. music sounds good. Music is more. Music is more of an art. Mm -hmm. So I hear a little bit of noise coming out of the uh, air conditioning system. Could that be music? Mm -hmm. It could be if that's what the art called for. All right. So, so here, here's one definition that I really like. There's a lot, it's not the only definition, but um, but I like this one. So music is sound organized in time. Okay. So. It's important when the sounds happen. If they happen in a way that's pleasing, sometimes they happen in a way that's, that's displeasing, and that's part of the art. So, so what we're going to really focus on today is sound and time, how they work together. Okay. And organize, the word organized implies intention. It's not something that randomly happened. A tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it. Music is something that's intentional. Someone's doing it on purpose. Right. It's right. So as a as an artist, you, your job is to find interesting sounds and also to organize them in a way that you think are going to, is going to be interesting to an audience, right? And that's really true even not in music. I mean, that's whatever career you, you, you follow, you're probably going to be organizing different things and bringing them together in a way that's valuable to people, right? So this is just, you know, music is sort of one example of that. Everybody knows what sound is, right? It's something to hit your ears, right? But let's, we're going to look a lot more detail about what sound is today. So sound, it, when we talk about this organization, you've all seen a piano keyboard. And you probably know the low notes are on your left and the high notes are on your right. And you've seen middle C. Well, uh, and, and you, you probably all heard an orchestra tune up. They usually use 440. Wait, you anybody know what the 440 is? Why do we call it A440? 440 of what? Okay. Yeah, so it's beats per second. So if, if you if you could slow everything way down, you would actually hear that that note actually is a whole series of beats hitting your ear. Oscillating back and forth. Right, right. And, and if it does it 440 times, that, that's the pitch that we have identified as that's going to be our concert tuning note, and we're going to call it an A. But the 440 happened a long time before A ever happened, right? It was always there. It was, it was before language. It was before any of that. Um, and so the human hearing can go down to maybe, well, on the low end, you can really hear, you know, you, uh, 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 I mean, you hear beats that slow. Uh, on the high end, uh, I stopped at 10,000, which is kind of the right, the right edge of the piano. Uh, you all can probably hear maybe even 18,000 beats a second. Um, Ed and I probably can hear 15,000 if we're lucky. Um, and you're, if you have a dog, how many of you have dogs? Yeah, they can probably hear like They can probably hear 25,000, so they can hear, they can hear pitches that we just can't hear. Or if we look at some common things that you're familiar with, uh, a whistle at the very high end typically would be 10,000 or even 15,000. Beats per second. A uh, trumpet's going to be somewhere in the middle of, of record or a flute, the right? The, the thing I put on the left is a tornado. Hopefully, you've not experienced that, but people who have kind of describe the, that same experience as, oh, it's like a freight train coming through. Well, of course, a freight train's never come through your, your living room, but it's, it's, it's very low pulsation. <laughs> very, very low pulsation, and that's down uh, probably in the 10 or 20 beats a second. Sort of thing. You've seen uh, probably subwoofers in in uh, sound systems. 
that they're, they're designed to do those low frequencies up to about 50 or 60 hertz. Uh, and everything else, the normal speakers, can handle more, higher sounds. We're going to use a tool today, and it's called Isotope. Uh, Isotope is a company, and they've got a whole bunch of really advanced tools. Uh, this one in particular is called RX6, and we're going to use it to look at all these different sounds that we have. And um, just to give you an orientation, so we've talked about organizing in, in time. We looked at frequency. This time we're going to put frequency on the Y scale from the bottom to the top. So the highest, maybe you can point out there, John, the high frequencies are at the top of the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, so the, right. this is getting up there. This isn't quite getting there. You can't barely right. see it. And then on the left, we have uh, time. So, it's, so this is, we'd actually play this from left to right, and you hear a pattern of music coming out because it's sound, out, sound organized in time. Right. Okay, so here's, so now we're looking at RX4, and what does it look like to you? A laser line. It just looks like a straight line, okay. So, so does that? So, what would you expect that to sound like? It's just one, one sound, the same thing over and over. Same note. And, 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 and if you notice, there's there's nothing below it, and really nothing above it, other than just right nearby that pitch. So that's kind of a, that's that's called a sine wave. Uh, if you study trigonometry, you're going to see the formulas for, for the sine function. But basically, if, as it's drawn, it's a smooth wave that, that goes up and down smoothly. And that, that's the sine function, and, and it has that, that sound. Okay, one, of the, one of the things that's characteristic about this is that it doesn't have any overtones. Does it, does it sound natural or artificial? Artificial. Yeah, very artificial, because most of the world has some overtones. Okay. Okay, this, what, now what do you see? Um, it's, it's going up. It's going up. Do you see any overtones? Uh, uh, this no. like, Maybe the, the line. This is motion. empty up here, so there's no overtones. No overtones. So it's still a sine wave, but it's going to sweep through the whole spectrum. And if you notice, the stuff at the very left is really way down there uh, in the lowest frequencies. We won't even be able to hear them because these speakers that we have in the room can't reproduce them. So take care of your wear, wear earplugs when you have a chance. Okay, so even though it's an artificial sound, you can still make music with a sine wave. And I've got an example of that. Here's a little composition that somebody did. And what do you see here? A lot of overtones. Well, these aren't overtones, those are really separate notes. Can we talk about why this? One down here. Yeah, right. so we, this is a stereo file. So we have the left channel on the top half and we have the right channel on the bottom half. And if you notice, uh, everything else we're looking at today is just a mono signal, so we have just one, one chart. But here the sounds are quite a bit different between the two, so I wanted to leave them so you can see the difference between the left and the right channel. What, what, what differences do you see? The left one is brighter. It's brighter, so that's going to be a little louder. And it looks like the tails are a little longer. If you can see sort of a comet tail on each one, that's a little bit of reverberation. It looks like the, the notes on the left channel reverberate a little more. Let's just listen to a little of that. say about sine waves because most of what we deal with is not sine waves. It, most of what we deal with is more complex sounds and that's what we're going to look at now. Okay, so here, here's, a, here, here's the sound of a flute playing. So let's see what we can observe about that. Okay, 
so did that sound like a sine wave? Um, no. So how, how is it different than a sine wave? Because it was more natural sound. More natural sound. It was the sound that you recognize as a flute, I bet. There's more than one line in here, so doesn't that mean that there was more than one flute playing? Maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was a single note. Okay, so does it sound like multiple notes or does it sound like one note? Okay, so why, what, how do you explain everything that's above that first line then? It's a word that he used earlier. Um, overtone. 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 Right. So, so, so all of our instruments have a package of overtones when you play them, and uh, it just naturally happens because of the way the instruments are built. With a with a sax, you might have more overtones because you've got some interaction with the reed. Uh, but so, if you look at that, I think that first that first line above the, the, the bottom one is the note, the pitch itself, and then the next one is probably an octave above. That and then and then an octave or maybe a fifth above that. Well, it's like that. You can play like a C, then a G, then a high C. Then well, but it's all one note. You're only playing the C. Mm -hmm. But but those other notes are part of what you're hearing. You only hear it as one pitch. But in fact, it's a bunch of pitches. In fact, let me let me just I'm going to take I'm going to subtract away that bottom pitch. So he can use this computer tool to silence the very bottom line, and you will only hear the overtones, not the fundamental. I just got rid of, remember the first pitch? Ah. This is the fifth pitch. It, that lot, it's, it's, an octave, it's an octave, it's an octave higher, right? And let's just see what the next one is, if I take that part off. But that was all, it was all there before, you just didn't hear it. You heard it, but you didn't recognize it as being a separate note, which is actually a good thing. So here's the next overtone. So that, that's actually a, 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 a strong fifth component to that. I'm not sure which of the overtones that is. All sounds inside of the main sound you hear. Yeah. So it was all there before. You just really were, your ear was trained, you were already trained to hear the fundamental pitch. But because those other pitches were part of the sound, you said, oh, that's what a flute sounds like, because the flute has all these different overtones. So let's look at an oboe, which is a little different. Same, same notes. So does that sound like a flute? So visually, does it look different than the flute? Yeah. Well, that it's, it's got a whole bunch more overtones, right? Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, those, it's the very same note. The fundamental is the same. So if we just listen to the fundamental, it's the same note. Now we're doing the opposite of getting rid of the overtones. That's what it would sound like if we took away all those overtones. And that, that sounds like a sine wave or, or sounds closer to the flute without those overtones. Even though you can do that with this computer program, you can't actually take away the overtones when you play the actual instrument. You can't like cut the top of the instrument off because that wouldn't work that way. No, but, but on some instruments you can cause the overtones to be more excited with the way that you play, you play your instrument. Sometimes with really strong attack, you, you momentarily create extra overtones. Uh, and I know on brass instrument, if you really get the air moving fast, you create a, a lot stronger overtones than what uh, than what you would normally have. It's a mute, and with a mute, really exaggerates the overtones. So let's look at one more. This is a tenor sax. What are you, what are you seeing here? You know, this would be an octave lower. A lot of overtones. A lot of overtones. A lot of overtones. So let's listen to what that sounds like. Like the overtones like yeah, so, so the, the, load of the, the overtones are louder. Yeah, in fact, you see, you almost see what, what you might call an undertone there at the very bottom. I'm not sure. Maybe say what you just said again. It was way. Well, yeah, that was vibrato. I think if we zoom in on this, let's see if we can zoom in. Barely make it out visually. Yeah, let's, let's zoom. I'm going to zoom in. 
Now you can see the undulations of the sound, the vibrato, as the note goes up and down really fast. changing the intensity of the sound rather than varying the pitch because mm -hmm. uh, we're not really he's not really da, yeah, 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 yeah. He's not really going up and down the pitch very much it's more ha 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 uh, diff just diff different intensity of the note and you because you, you don't really see it moving up and down much do you? Yeah. it was a little bit and you can see a little bit of the up and down but a lot of it is intensity you can see real clear pulsations there so a tenor sax you would never mistake a sax for a flute, right? Even if they're playing the same note. And that's why, because your ear is automatically processing all those overtones. You know, the nice thing about it is it's automatic, right? It's all around us. We, we hear it all the time. We mean to say, oh, you, don't, you don't say, oh, I heard 17 overtones, therefore it must be a tenor sax. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't do that. You just say, oh, that's a tenor sax. You say, ew, it must be a tenor sax. <laughs> that's right. You know, right. It's, it's like so that. let's look at some other things. What would happen if you put in lots and lots of frequencies? What if you put what if you played something at every single frequency? Um, or it's not exactly every single frequency. But if you played so what do you think that's going to sound like? A mess. Uh -huh. What kind of a mess? It's not a bad. But it sounds like a pain like an unorganized <gasps> mess. Yeah. Like like what? This is every piece of music you've ever heard happening in the same. Now right, well, let's listen to it. I think I think it's it's even worse than what you think. Radio, radio <laughs> noise or something, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's called this is, a, this is a specific pattern called white noise, and it's actually useful. We actually do white noise on purpose. So if you're if you're setting up, let's say you you're taking a sound system to an arena, and you're getting set up for a concert, and you've never you've never had your sound system in that arena before. Uh, what you can do is you can pipe white noise through your sound system before the band gets there, and you'll find that it's supposed to be even, but if you then put a microphone out and measure it and put it on this tool or a similar tool, you'll find out some frequencies are not even. And that says, okay, for the audience to hear the band the way the band wants to be heard, I'll have to boost up those frequencies that are not showing up in the real world. So you actually use white noise to help you calibrate your sound system in, 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 a, in, a familiar, in an unfamiliar space. Yeah. Okay, so do we have any instruments that would look at all like this? No. no. Yes, we do. Crash. Right. Yep. Say that louder. Crash cymbal. Crash cymbal is a good choice. So here's a crash cymbal. We got a lot of frequencies. You want to listen to it? No. So basically. Like, notice these things release. Yeah, so you can see the intensity is all the way at the attack point. But what happens with the, with the sounds that remain? Are they all the same sound? No. Well, which, sounds are, which sounds are sustained the longest? That bottom one and the one that just is going to break down. Right, so the, so the high ones dissipate quickly, and the lower ones tend to, tend to float a little longer. Here's another one. <laughs> This is a this is a choked symbol. It's like a hi hat that you yeah. hit and then close. That's the tech version. So what what do you see on this one? Well, see, where's the where's the strongest sound? At the end. At the end when you choke it, right? So so we, we, we hit it, but then when we choke it, it really makes a big sound. Let's look at one other one. This this one is this one is the classic case of, of strange overtones. Tu tubular bells is the British term for the chimes. We saw them right over here. Big, the tall bronze. Yeah, and so with these, they, the the fundamental is not as loud as the first overtone, and that so that makes chimes sound really funny. 
So this, there's the fundamental. The fundamental dies out pretty early, and the note that you really hear is, is, a, is an octave and a fifth above it, I believe. It's that one there. That's really an overtone, but it's you can't. It's so loud that you kind of think, wait a minute, which note is the real note? That, that's why. That's why chimes sound the way they do. One more. What, what do you think this would be? What, what do we see here? Let's align. Vibrato. Did you see? Does anybody see vibrato? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a very strong vibrato. Any idea where you get such a strong vibrato? And this is oh, music. It's, yeah. Tenor. No, this, yeah, so tenor what? Um, opera, nice. This is an opera singer. <laughs> opera singers tend to be trained to allow their vocal cords to be completely flexible and to get the maximum sound to fill up a hall. And that, that causes, that allows a really wide vibrato oftentimes, which is considered, you know, classical. Opera. This is one person singing one pitch. Okay, so that's a pretty high note, right? So how high do you think that tenor can actually sing? Yeah. All right. So, but how? What if I told you you could sing four octaves higher than that? Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to take all these strong pitches out here. I'm going to delete all these strong pitches, and this is just the upper stuff. This is that same voice. I, I didn't touch it. You, you saw me. All I did was take out the lower stuff. Nothing, nothing up my sleeves. All I did was took it, took out the, the first five or six uh, overtones. That's part of what he's singing. Sounds like Aiden's. Pretty high, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, when, when, when that, you know, maybe if, if we tried to sing opera, we probably wouldn't have all those rich overtones and we probably wouldn't get the gig. But that's part of why this guy is, uh, you know, is, is working as an opera singer because, because he's able to create such a rich sound. What happens if you just take out the overtones and leave the fundamental or maybe two of them? It'll sound like one of us, I think. So it doesn't sound nearly as doesn't sound nearly as powerful, does it? When you when you add the overtones, that that really brings in all the richness. Okay, so so um, to wrap up this first of the two part series, let's see if we can summarize a little bit. So what what we said about overtones is they're they're part of they're they're around us everywhere. Uh, they give the they give the music a complete sound, or they give the voice a complete sound. What else have we learned today? The, the overtones help, help you recognize what instruments are playing. And if you're a composer, you might be thinking about the overtones from different instruments, and that may affect your choice about which instruments you want to have playing at a certain time, because maybe you want to see how, how they're, you might want to put an oboe together with a tenor sax or something, because you want to blend those two different kinds of sounds. So, so they, uh, they're really all around us. What we really wanted to do today was just become uh, aware of those. In the second part of the series that we'll, uh, uh, that we'll move on to, uh, we're going to look at some examples of us actually making some sounds and see what that does. Does that sound like fun?